A very warm welcome, good afternoon, good evening, from the UKLFI Charitable Trust. Today, we will be looking at UN human rights systems and how to engage with them. And how can these mechanisms be used to counter anti-Semitism? And how the completely disproportionate and excessive scrutiny of Israel factors into the equation? We'll be uh, answering your questions, and if you could please pop those questions into the Q and A box um, down below, uh, we would endeavor. We will endeavor for our speaker to answer them. We are honored to have join us today, Rosa Friedman. Uh, Rosa is the inaugural professor of law, conflict, and global development at the University of Reading. She received her LLB, LLM, and PhD from the University of London and is a non-practicing barrister, a member of the Honourable Society of Grey's Inn. Friedman's research focuses on the UN human rights. She has published extensively on UN human rights bodies and systems, and on UN peacekeeping and accountability for human rights abuses committed during such operations. Her published work includes three monographs, two edited collections, and articles in various leading law journals. Friedman is a member of the UN Secretary General's Civil Society Advisory Board on Prevention of Sexual Exploitation and Abuse, and is a specialist advisor on safeguarding to the UK Government and International Development Committee. And she sits on the UK FCO Women, Peace and Security Steering Group. Rosa, the floor is yours. And thank you so much for inviting me, Jonathan, and all of the organisation. Jews and Jewish communities are often mistrustful of the United Nations, and particularly of the United Nations human rights system. There are many reasons for that, and we'll explore some of them. But the outcome is that until three years ago, there were no UN reports on anti-Semitism as a specific human rights abuse. In 2019, the first report was delivered to the UN General Assembly and that marked a pivotal moment, both for the UN human rights system, but also for Jewish communities around the world. Condemnation of racism in Palestine by one of the UN treaty bodies also occurred for the first time in 2019. And in 2020, there was an appointment of a high representative for the United Nations on combating anti-Semitism. These are all positive changes, but they are just the first steps towards protecting human rights of Jews around the world. The purpose of my talk today is to give a, a very, and I mean very brief overview of the UN human rights mechanisms, but to talk to you all about how people can engage with them and why this area matters. It is really important to emphasize at the outset and throughout this talk that the United Nations is a political body. It is made up of the 193 member states that are the bosses of this body, but also that make up this body. Because it is a political body, there will be politics and there will be politicization. The United Nations reflects the material reality of our world. And there will be some, and I imagine some amongst us, who will point to the challenges of the UN system and who will argue that, UN, that, that Jews simply should not engage with the UN. There are some amongst us, I'm one of them, who argued that the Jews should not engage with Labour any further when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader. There will be others that might argue that Jews should not remain in Britain or even in Europe. And so the absolute underpinning of this talk is, should we engage? And I, my argument is that we should do. And if so, how and why should we do so? Before we even start talking about the United Nations and human rights, I want to give a little background, which some of you may or may not know about Israel and the UN. A key question that many Jews ask, including around my Friday night dinner table, is why does the United Nations focus so much attention on Israel? 
Why does the UN focus such excessive and disproportionate attention on a very small state in a region where there are many other grave and atrocious human rights violations being committed by other countries at any one time? The answer that I give may or may not be the right one, but it's the one that I stick to, which is that focusing on Israel creates an ostensible success story. The UN can point to its action in Israel in order to show that it is successfully protecting human rights. Often this type of extensive scrutiny provides a kind of political and diplomatic pressure that will force a country to stop abusing human rights. And we've seen that in many other areas. The point here though, when focusing that attention, it's not really to focus on the country, but to mask or to shift the spotlight away from other countries that are committing the same or far worse human rights abuses elsewhere. So the question is, why is Israel excessively scrutinized? What are the political motivations for this disproportionate attention? And what is the impact that that has on human rights abuses around the world? At the UN, when it comes to Israel, there is no direct link between the gravity of the situation and the decision to focus the amount of attention that the UN does on that country. No one, I would hope no one, would suggest that Israel does not commit human rights abuses. Of course it does. But every country commits human rights abuses from Sweden to Somalia. Israel, I hope no one would argue, is not um, a state that avoids scrutiny. Israel occupies land, it occupies lands of the occupied Palestinian territory and indeed the occupied Syrian territory of the Golan. That does not mean that there aren't tens or hundreds of millions of people in worse situations of occupation than the ones that are under Israeli rule. Yet Israel has become a focal point for the United Nations. Let me give you a tiny example, which I'm sorry for the younger people in the room who might not know this one. In 2004, during the UN Commission on Human Rights session, at the same time that the commission voted against taking action on the Russian incursion, invasion and war in Chechnya, it passed five resolutions about Israel. That disparity cannot be explained in terms of the gravity of the two conflicts. The second intifada in Israel, the uprising, took place and started around the same time that I took my gap year in that country. At the same time, Russia invaded Chechnya and started the second Chechnya war. Amnesty International reported that by 2004, the spiraling violence in Chechnya, sorry, the spiraling violence in, in Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territories have resulted in the deaths of 3,200 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis. Every death is tragic. That was far fewer than the deaths in Chechnya. Tens of thousands of Palestinians were made homeless during that period. Again, many more Chechens were displaced. Both armed conflicts involved gross and systemic human rights violations. If any of you want to read up on this, I would encourage you to read One Soldier's War about the war in Chechnya, written by a Russian soldier about the grave and atrocious human rights violations that were perpetrated against civilians on purpose by the Russians. But while the graver situation in Chechnya was all but ignored, excessive scrutiny was given to the Israel-Palestine conflict. That pattern has been repeated across the UN. But the obvious question is why Israel? Why has this disproportionate attention been given at the UN since the creation of Israel by the United Nations itself? Why were a quarter of all Commission on Human Rights country resolutions about Israel while not one single one focused on China, 
Why does the UN General Assembly discuss and pass resolutions about Israel at almost every session, but fails to devote even a fraction of that time to countries such as India, Sri Lanka, and Turkey, all of whom occupy other people's lands? The answer is because most states either support or tacitly accept such scrutiny. And if we go back to the purpose of this talk, most of those states do so not because they care about Israel or Palestine, but because they're thinking about the politics and the material reality of our world. The General Assembly in particular has lacked any form of even handedness on Israel. Let's start with Resolution 379 in 1975, entitled Zionism is Racism. That resolution reflected international politics and diplomatic relations at that time. Arab countries have gained significant strength and influence, largely owing to the oil weapon. Many Arab states have participated in or supported the wars against Israel in 1948, 1967, and 1973. They use the General Assembly to focus attention on Palestine and denounce Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. Resolution 3379 equated Zionism with racism, and it challenged the state of Israel's right to exist. Now, where it comes to human rights, at the heart of human rights is this idea that all peoples have the right of self-determination. Yet, at the heart of every UN resolution on Israel or Zionism, it states that Jews are the one nation that do not have the right of self-determination, the right to their own land and the right to determine who governs over them. The USSR, the Soviet Union, supported those Arab states. They had once viewed Israel as a potentially socialist or even communist state. But as it increasingly became allied with the US and the West, the USSR lent on these ideas of anti-imperialism to bring together an anti-Israel stance at the UN. Many of the Western states who ought to have supported Israel were themselves former colonial masters and therefore shied away from defending this embryonic country from its right of self-determination. Now we know that the resolution 3379, the Zionism is racism resolution was repealed in 1991. But that's not the end of the disproportionate scrutiny and the lack of even handedness on Israel. Israel commits grave human rights violations, not only against Palestinians or against Syrians in the occupied Golan territories, but also against Israeli Arabs. Israel is a democratic state. We know that democratic states from Sweden all the way through to Britain commit grave violations. But this disproportionate scrutiny is not even handed, it is excessive, and it is not okay. For many years throughout my career, first working at, well, working on a PhD at the UN Human Rights Council, and then working in terms of UN human rights bodies, I felt the need to apologize for the, for the human rights abuses committed by Israel. Often, and I know that this is being recorded, because people at the UN would ask me, Rosa, what are your people doing in Gaza right now? And I said, my people, my people are British. And they said, no, but you're a Jew. It is only over the years and with growing confidence that I can say Israel commits human rights abuses, but also the way Israel is treated by the UN is not okay. Excessive scrutiny did not go unnoticed at the UN. And it was so obvious in 2006 that Secretary General Kofi Annan called on the UN Human Rights Council to stop focusing on Israel while being silent at the same time on other grave situations, but little notice was taken. At the Security Council, which um, I know I don't have enough time to go into this in great depth, where there are five countries with veto powers, Israel does not escape criticism but certainly escapes any form of action from the council. At the General Assembly, there is a, a kind of counterbalance to that where there is an excessive scrutiny on Israel. 
What I would like you to hold in your mind as we go through the UN human rights mechanisms is that countries like China, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba, the United States, France, and many others who hold power in all of those bodies escape scrutiny altogether for far worse or, and I'm sorry, Dad, for using this word, more egregious abuses than Israel has ever committed. So now to get to the heart of the talk with the background that we all knew, which is that the UN does focus far too much on Israel and for, for reasons that are not related hugely to their human rights abuses. Why should we engage with the UN human rights system? I wrote a very long, a very technical paper on this. I'm not going to give it to you. But if any of you want it, I'll email it to you. International human rights law as we know it today sprung from the ashes of Nazi Germany. Up until the point that Hitler Yamach Schumer put people into ghettos, onto trains, and into death camps, it was not unlawful to treat your own citizens however you wanted. You could deny them their right to education, their right to the workplace, or even their right to life, and it was fine. The only laws that existed were how you treated people from other countries. After the horrors of Nazi Germany came to the fore, this era of international human rights law came, came into being. And in 1948, the United Nations declared that we all have human rights by virtue of being born human. Those human rights range from our right to life and our right to health, our right to leisure, but we all hold them irrespective of our race, our religion, our nationality, our class, or any other protected characteristic. Where it comes to Jews, and where it comes to Jews and human rights and anti-Semitism, these rights are not very well explained. And largely, I would argue, because Jews mistrust the United Nations and have not engaged properly with the United Nations system. In terms of the international human rights framework, our right to not have anti-Semitism perpetrated against us as Jews falls under the rights to not be discriminated against, the rights to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, the obligation of states to prohibit any racial or religious hatred, the obligations to end racial discrimination, the obligation to eradicate racist propaganda, and the obligation to ensure that we have effective protection and remedies where any discrimination based on our religion or our race exists. Now, for those of you that are in the UK, you will know that there is a, a sort of weird distinction between us as Jews as a race and us as Jews as a religion. And this has come out through the JFS case and through this idea of who counts as a Jew for different purposes. But we are protected both under the freedom of religion and belief aspect of human rights and the freedom from racial discrimination aspect. So what could the UN human rights mechanisms do for us? Well, we could spend a good few hours talking about what they haven't done for us, but I want to go through what they can do for us. In terms of the mechanisms, the main UN body on human rights is the UN Human Rights Council. Now, Many of you will hear me say the UN Human Rights Council, and you'll think about Hillel Neuer, UN Watch, or other people that tells you that the UN Human Rights Council is wholly biased against Israel, wholly biased against Jews, and what's the point? But let me tell you a little bit about them first before you make up your, your mind. The UN Human Rights Council is made up of 47 member states, approximately a third of UN members at any given time. And it is supposed to be representative of the different geographies that the UN calls the geographies, the five different regional groups. The, the Human Rights Council is a political body. It is there to represent the politics of the state. It's not made up of independent experts. And as such, it doesn't have binding powers, but it has a huge amount on promotion and development 
of human rights. It does that through its main meetings, at least 10 weeks of the year, its special sessions or grave or crisis situations, its universal periodic review, where it reviews every single country's human rights records every four and a third, four and a quarter years, and through its fact-finding commissions and commissions of inquiries. Now, people can engage with the Human Rights Council or disengage, and this comes back to my main message, which is if we, as Jews, don't engage, we're not heard, our voices aren't represented, and our evidence does not form part of the fact-finding, the information sharing, and the development and promotion of human rights. We can engage in many ways. The Human Rights Council was created in 2006 to overcome all of the problems of its predecessor, including the fact that Libya chaired it under Colonel Gaddafi. Okay? The, the Human Rights Council was created in such a way that it encourages civil society to engage. You can watch its sessions or webcasts. You can ask for accreditation and run side events. You can go and sit in the public gallery. You can meet with states. You can ask governments to represent you in their statements. You can give shadow reports to the Universal Periodic Review, or you can completely disengage. But by disengaging, you're doing a disservice not only to yourself, but also to that UN human rights body that requires and needs the evidence and fact finding that you can gather. Engaging means putting forward our facts and our viewpoints to counter dominant narratives. There are many states and actors in the council who need those facts to support their position. I'll give you a slight anecdote, and I know I'm being recorded, and I hope I get this correct. When the Human Rights Council was being created, there was this idea that there ought to be a standing agenda. That standing agenda would mean that different things were being discussed at different points during each of the sessions of the Human Rights Council. And there was a, a blanket ban on any standing agenda items being related to a particular country. A proposal was put forward that there ought to be a standing agenda item on Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, some countries wanted that because that would shield any scrutiny of any other issues going on in the Middle East or North Africa that might be as bad or worse as what was going on in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. But other countries said, okay, we'll support this because it might just keep all those discussions of Israel and the OPT to two or three or four days of a one month long session. And that would leave us some room to talk about other issues and not let Israel be brought in at every possible point. Clearly what we've seen since 2006 is, you know, it's not true. The first group were right. But had there been greater engagement from civil society to explain that actually Israel and the OPT will be brought up at all sorts of different areas, maybe that standing agenda item wouldn't have been put onto the record. And it's not for me to say one way or other, but that's certainly the view of people that I speak to. Outside of the UN Human Rights Council, outside of their sessions, they have this universal periodic review. This is probably the most open to civil society. People can submit shadow reports, they can get together, or they can do it individually. They can submit questions, not only around Israel, not only around OPT or Syria or Iran, but what about countries like Belarus, where we've seen that time and again, the, the special procedures, and I'll come back to them, reports on Belarus show how much anti-Semitism is going on in that country. What about submitting questions to countries where we know that anti-Zionism has become anti-Semitism, like Venezuela? Using that forum, to submit questions and recommendations and reports on where anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism becomes a way not only to ask questions of that country, but to open up to every other country in the world, the idea 
that challenging a nation state's absolute right to exist becomes a human rights issue. Another mechanism is the treaty bodies and treaty bodies are there to monitor how states who become party to treaties implement their, their human rights obligations. A state has to agree to become party to that treaty. It's a unilateral decision. It's very different. I, if, I, if I had you all in a classroom, I talk about how I could buy your bananas, you could buy my cucumbers and someone could buy a frat's mangoes and it become quite complicated. But suffice to say, it's quite difficult to get states to sign up to unilateral obligations, ones that they can't get out of. But once they are signed up to them, they have to report in on how well they're upholding these treaty obligations. This work matters, whether it's around the obligations against torture, whether it's around more general ones on economic and social rights, or whether, as we saw in 2019, it's around eliminating racial discrimination. In 2019, the committee that, that monitors eliminating racial discrimination it issued its concluding observation on Palestine's periodic report. And for the first time, that treaty body criticized the Palestinian authorities. It criticized them about the racist hate speech and hate crimes, including incitement to violence against Israelis and Jews. It expressed its concerns about hate speech in media outlet, particularly those controlled by Hamas, particularly those controlled by public officials, and particularly in school curricula. Of course, this was only a small part of its report. It is absolutely crucial to know that it's only through the actions of civil society and civil society is all of us that that committee, that treaty body, even knew and understood the importance of, of fighting against that racial discrimination and hatred. Special procedures, who are they and what are they? I'm going to, I'm going to run through this fast. Um, these are independent experts. They're appointed um, for no money, mostly because they're, they're good people who care about a particular issue area. It might be a country, it might be a thematic issue. A thematic issue might be the impact of foreign debt on human rights. The two key special procedures mandate holders in terms of Jews and anti-Semitism are the ones on freedom of religion and belief and the ones on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. In 2019, the first ever UN human rights report specifically on anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse was published at the UN General Assembly and the UN Human Rights Council. It was published by the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, who was at that time Ahmed Shahid. That report was game changing. It didn't just look at anti Semitism as a human rights abuse in terms of whether or not Jews can eat food that has been killed for Shkheta. It looked at anti Semitism across the board, from left wing anti Semitism to, to radical Islamic anti Semitism to white supremacist anti Semitism. And it did a triangulation of all three of them. It looked at them as a human rights abuse in terms of Jews' ability to walk down the street wearing kippah, which many Jews would say, well, I can't wear a kippah, but I can still practice my religion by praying in a synagogue. And the, the special rapporteur said, but your right to manifest your religion goes beyond private practice. The UN Special Rapporteur, supported by many people, I was one of them, I was very fortunate to be one of them, met with Jews from the 98 countries of 193 countries around the world where Jews live. The key themes that came out of it were the soldiers that stand outside shuls, even ones that aren't open in Holland all day long and all night long, the children that go to, to school behind barbed wire in different ways in Turkey, the, the, the security is far, far stronger than it might be in Brazil, but everywhere that kids go to school, there is some form of security. The things that came out were around social media, and this has particularly come out since 2019, the blaming of Jews for COVID, 
They blame me of Jews for pretty much everything. As the world implodes, Jews become the bad guy. And how to hold to account states, um, how to hold to account non-state actors and everyone else. This was the first major step for the UN human rights machinery in understanding that anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse goes beyond racism or freedom of religion or belief, but that it really seeps into freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, and all sorts of other human rights issues that people don't understand comes into our lives as Jews. So moving forwards in the next step, and I'm gonna finish really quick there for I promise. There are fundamental differences between the Jewish community's approach and the UN human rights community's approach to monitoring and understanding and combating anti-Semitism, including anti-Zionism as an anti-Semitic issue. What I'm gonna focus on now is our approach. And I will send out if anyone wants it, the UN's approach. Jewish communities need to better articulate our concerns. We, we look at the state and we crave their security. We also know that a state or a government's security can trigger its own human rights abuses. So we don't want to criticize governments. We don't want to upset officials. We don't want to rock the boat. But at the same time, we hold in our hands, whether it's through CST or any other similar organizations in other countries, the evidence, the data, the knowledge of what's going on on the ground. So we need to better understand how to feed in that knowledge. We do it very well with the OSCE, with the, EU, uh, with the EU's fundamental rights agencies. We trust some organizations, but not others. We need to learn to trust a bit better the UN human rights bodies, to share that data on anti-Semitism and to share it in order that we can advance the protection and promotion of our rights. We need to take the steps, and I hope I've given you just a couple of them, but take steps to understand the UN human rights mechanisms, to understand the framework and the language, to understand how we can submit individual complaints, how we can submit shadow reports, how we can work with the UN in ways that do not expose individuals to human rights abuses. I'm thinking about the eight individuals in Egypt. No one wants to expose them to it, but if you've got 250,000 Jews in England and the CST, we can feed that data in in ways that doesn't expose individuals to further human rights abuses. We need to submit more of that data, more of that understanding of how to gather it. We need to work far better with the UN mechanisms. We need to trust them that while we might know from the evidence that the UN itself reflects the material reality of this world, which is imperfect, and political, that there are good people working within it who want to advance, not undermine our rights as Jews and as humans. Thank you very much. Rosa, thank you so much for this really illuminating talk. And especially, I think you've, you've helped to transform our understanding of the way that the UN functions so that it's not entirely a lost cause that we do have um, agency somewhere and that we can do something about the the situation so i've got um i've got several questions that i'll um, endeavor to, to answer uh, i might pick up with the first kind of question just because you mentioned it at the close of your talk um, the UN, as you said, is meant to reflect the reality, the political reality within the world. And so, for example, in the last few weeks, we've seen in the Ukraine-Russia war, um, another reflection of the world, and we've seen Israel emerge as a potential peacemaker. We've seen with the Abraham Accords, Israel as a potential peacemaker, in, in Russia, a potential kingmaker. How do you see this changing reality on the ground being reflected at the United Nations? A great question, and it's, it's a tricky one. Um, on, on the one hand, um, here we've got the United Nations, which has um, ultimately the Security Council. Um, all the power is, is invested in the Security Council, and it's got five 
countries with veto powers. It's got Russia, China, the US, and then it's got France and the UK who haven't used their veto powers for a long time because they don't have the military to back them up or even the economy or the political power to do so. Um, maybe had there not been Brexit, France and the UK might have invested their vetoes into that. Um, we look at Israel, who has always required other countries like Germany to, to become almost these peacemakers. But Israel sits here on the fence in many ways in this material reality between the, the West and the former East in terms of the Cold War. Um, and, it, and it has had at various times different support from both of them. Um, if you're Israel, and we're straying a little bit outside of human rights here, so forgive me if I get this horribly wrong, but if, if you're Israel, you look at this idea of sovereignty, right? You look at Ukraine and say, a sovereign nation, or not to be walked into or destroyed. But at the same time, you look at the realities on the ground, which is around power, and particularly around Syria. Right. With let's be clear, without without Russia's uh, sort of um, intervention, all, all sorts of things could have happened through the Golan um, and 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 through Occupy Syrian territories into Israel. Um, I I gave a a talk about a week ago um, around Ukraine and what's and Ukraine and Russia and what's going to happen next. I think that this is the end of multilateralism as we know it and the start of a new one. And I think Israel is much better placed in this new world order than it was in the old one. I didn't answer your question, but you know. Well, it, it, it really does. It's, you helped answer where we're headed, which I think will help us all navigate the way we get round, uh, our heads round the, um, uh, our, our own engagement in it. Um, I'd like to cover another area in which we've had a couple of questions. Um, the um, Israel's recent successful rescue of its Arab Israeli citizens alongside together with its rescue of its Jewish Israeli citizens from war-torn Ukraine was impressive by any standards. Therefore, um, one viewer's question is, and it amalgamates a couple of others, facing up to being wrongly accused of being an apartheid state, how can we cha challenge that uh, effectively? And how can Israel better communicate its vital message of diversity of, and inclusion and admirable humanitarian actions to the world in order to counter and overturn decades of Arab anti-Semitic diatribes against Israel, and indeed um, anti-Semitic tropes from, from every direction. So I think this idea of the apartheid state um, is something that if I'd have had four hours, not half an hour, I'd have gone into more. Um, South Africa was an, had apartheid policies, was an apartheid state, and, and I personally, and I hope many others, would agree it's a good thing that, that you know, that that state was dismantled and that um, apartheid policies were, were taken apart and, and, and buried and a new constitution was built. At the same time, the USSR, in terms of Chechens, um, in terms of many others, Uzbeks, people from Kazakhstan, and apparently what we're hearing from, from Maripol is, is still doing the same, is um, was a country with similar apartheid policies, same with um, China and the Uyghurs, China and the Tibetans and other places. The, this idea that there is a one rule for one and second class citizens elsewhere is, is atrocious where, where it comes to human rights and full stop. The, the comparison of Israel with South Africa as an apartheid state, when Israel is a democracy, and I, I do believe that, I, I do see the evidence that Israel commits human rights abuses against its own Arab citizens. Are they apartheid abuses, apartheid policies? Not as far as I can see. Um, I'm, I'm yet to see the evidence. I'm happy to be convinced if someone provides them. Um, so I think that the language used already in that question is very difficult to, to address. We, we have to be careful with language. There, there, apartheid means something particular. 
human rights abuses mean something particular. Um, how we how we counter that narrative is you know, uh, before I even get to the question, which I may not get to at all, but how we counter that narrative is understanding what language means and being able to engage with it and talk to people and say, where is there an apartheid policy here? Where is there, uh, there's discrimination, everyone has a right to not be discriminated against and sure, Arab Israelis are discriminated against on many levels, but how do you define that as apartheid? Until you've unpacked that, you can't then get to the heart of the problem that you're trying to solve. Language is key, I would say, Afrat. And even more so the need to, uh, to be familiar and conversant with that language, I guess, the technical legal terms and what they represent and um, to, to then be able to equip, I guess, to, to engage with that language. Um. No, absolutely, and I think I think having examples to feed back to people is key in these situations. Often, it, language is used in a very inflammatory way. Um, so, being able to diffuse that situation by saying, "Do you mean apartheid in this way, or do you mean discrimination in this way?" makes a huge difference because many people don't know the difference between the two and once you unpack it with them then they can get to the heart of the issue that they want to discuss rather than this kind of weird sun newspaper headlines which doesn't help anyone i guess that you're touching on something that kind of came to my mind when you were talking about the social media onslaughts and when anything happens on the ground in in israel or in the region, um, how can we be better equipped when things like that do flare up so that we are able to uh, explain what's going on in a, in a cogent, conversant way that will be received and heard? I mean, my, the way I was taught was always have actionable feedback based on evidence. So, any views that you have, any views I have, are just views or opinions, unless they are actionable feedback based on very specific evidence. Go and do your homework. Go, I don't mean do your homework like by looking at Twitter. I mean, go and find the area that you're the most interested in, gather the evidence on it. If someone asks me about, I don't know, sports from Israel, I'll say, I know nothing about it, but you know, I watch it or something like that, right? But the thing I'm the expert on is on human rights and Israel and the United Nations. So go and dig deep and find the evidence, be able to back it up with sources. Everyone, as we know these days, is, um, is an expert. We all went from being experts on, um, on COVID to now experts on um, use of force in Ukraine and tomorrow will be experts on something else. But unless you've got something to back it up, your opinion matters no more and no less than the person you're talking to. You're just shouting in the wind. Um, find something, go and do some research, talk to people, email people. People like me are always happy to talk to people, right? Uh, but go and have the conversation so that when you are then advocating your position, even if I think you're wrong, you've got the evidence to back, back up your position, that already makes the conversation more important. No one's going to win hearts and minds by shouting on Twitter or Instagram. But people are going to change people's opinions one person at a time by showing them the evidence of what they're trying to say. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is a composite of different questions that are coming up about um, both coming up against um, institutional uh, uh, blockades and resources. Um, one question, one uh, of our viewers is asking, one problem with engagement is that it requires substantial resources to prepare effective submissions. Massive amounts of resources are devoted to UN bodies, states, NGOs that are often supported by massive state funding uh, to defame and undermine Israel. Can the 13 million Jews in the world devote comparable resources to make this anything approaching a fair contest? And is it possible to overcome uh, what is seemingly a huge institutional barrier? 
Yeah, somewhere between 14 million and 23 million Jews in the world, uh, more than 9 billion people. Um, I'd say that for us as Jews, we think that everyone cares the most about Jewish issues in Israel. I also work in lots of other UN and human rights contexts where people neither know nor care about Jews or Israel in a good way or a bad way. So I'm, I'm not sure that we're always countering the amount of people, the quantity or quality of people that we think we are or we're told we are. That being said, um, I, I think it depends on the forum that you're in. I mean, I wouldn't want to be sitting personally on Instagram or on Snapchat or Reddit or whatever young people do these days, I'm very old, clearly, um, fighting a bunch of, you know, wannabe neo-Nazis um, online. But where it comes to human rights issues at the UN, there's far fewer people who are trying to counter the narrative around anti-Semitism than you might find on Reddit. Um, so I think it's about where do you, where do you put your efforts? Where do you want to expend your energy? And that's not to say it's not important, but I do think shouting at strangers online, and I've done plenty of it myself, becomes counterproductive. Um, find your thing that you're interested in, the thing you want to become an expert on, whether it's an advocate, whether it's a full-time job or anything else, and run down that route. I, I have always found people to be very open to hearing about Jews and anti-Semitism in professional arenas. And I have always found that if I say something about it online, I get, you know, all sorts of delightful threats, which make me think that these are people that are just sitting behind a computer and, you know, have better things to do with their time, just don't realise it. So I think it's 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 about finding finding that side. But there are so many ways into the UN. And I, I think this is this is the message I want to bring forward is. Whether you want to go into the UN as an individual or as part of an NGO, or you want to submit communication to a treaty body or a special rapporteur, or you want to go and work there, or you just want to send them a piece of information or a report that you wrote about, you know, your local youth movement, do it. Because these are absolute human rights experts. And apart from the few bad apples that you get everywhere in the world, the vast majority will really want to engage with you. So do that, don't go on Twitter. Mum, do not tell me not to go on Twitter after this. I'm petrified of posting myself in case I start a war, I don't know. I don't know. But what I found um, really uh, during the last Gaza crisis, what was overwhelming, and I think a lot of far younger people than us <laughs> found overwhelming, is that when you have influencers who have followers, who are kind of exponent, who have followers, the numbers that are exponentially larger, larger than the numbers that there are Jews, um, putting out mistruths about what's going on, you feel like you are in the middle of a, an, an onslaught and that there's nothing you can do about it, but maybe there is. I think, I think the weird thing about all these, and I, I know nothing and I hope someone will correct me, but all these things about algorithms and everything else is, actually there'll be loads of people that you go on the record and say something about you know, anti-Semitism and they're supporting you, but because you follow lots of people, that wouldn't necessarily. So for me, it was for me it was leaving Labour. Right? It took me a long time to leave Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. It's the opposite. I was having this conversation with David Hirsch, who I think is here right now while we're talking, but um, this morning about the difference between the UN to me and Labour. For the UN, I feel like we as Jews need to engage with it. For Labour, I felt like under Jeremy Corbyn, I as a Jew needed to disengage with it. Right, but. But once, you're, once you know people or you're following them or there's an algorithm, suddenly you're only shown certain things. You're not shown the positives, you're only shown the negatives or the other way around. Um, and one of the things that, that's fascinating about the UN or, or even if you work with governments or if you work with OSCE or with Inter-Americas or African Union, depending on where you are, is that a lot of these experts do not engage on social media. So you don't actually see the fruits of your labor unless you go out and find them 
talk to them and then you see it actually happening in real life which kind of makes you think stop living your life online there are so many really interesting questions here rose i think we're going to need to ask um our, our wonderful organizers to see if we can have a, a, a sequel to this. Um, I've got an, another question, really interesting questions, question regarding anti-Semitism. At, at what point does ra do racist threats become child abuse? And this person is referring to anti-Jewish slogans being shouted outside schools or in the presence of children. I think comes down to national legislation, national laws. But so if, if there's a direct threat to the child or on the basis of being a child, then it would become sort of a child abuse law or a right to the child's issue. Um, bring it back to a, a broader area is um, what I was saying earlier about, about schools. Uh, I know as a parent, it's totally normal to me that, you know, children just have to go to school through security or through barbed wire. And then I found out doing this report on anti-Semitism in 2019, the kids in Turkey have to get into buses with different sequences being flashed in their bus every day to open the doors and every building around them having bulletproof glass in case a bomb goes off. And then you find out that there are places where no one knows where the Jewish schools are. Um, and so to what point does that become child abuse? Well, it, clearly it impacts the rights of the child, right? So if we go back to this issue of we, we're all born human, therefore we all have human rights and we have different additional rights based on our characteristics. I'm a woman, someone's a Jew, someone's a, you know, got a disability, so all different things. Right, it's almost a child, but ultimately being shouted at, and, and again, I know I'm being recorded, but I've said this publicly on Twitter, my kid when he was about eight or nine was walking down the road with his mate. Our road is a cul-de-sac, they were in Kipot, someone shouted, fucking Jew, or fuck off Jew, right? And my kid came home and said, you can only say fuck at a football match, not on Shabbat, right? That's how he took it, but is that child abuse? No, that's to me, racism, that's religious hatred. But there, there's all sorts of intersectionalities there. If the person had tried to do something else, maybe it might be a child's rights issue. But I think we, we have to first and foremost think of all these things as discrimination, because discrimination comes into every part of human rights. And if we're discriminating against that child or that person or that woman or that person with disability or the best of them being a Jew, it's terrible. Sorry for saying fuck repeatedly on camera. Don't worry, it, it, it would serve a purpose. Um, <laughs> uh, I have another question just to make use of your insider's view of the UN. Our viewer asks, um, their understanding is that the Shahid report provoked substantial internal backlash in the UN. However, they can see the value in the report for promoting the rights of Jewish people outside of the UN context. Do you think this is the real value of engagement, shifting the debate outside the UN as opposed to inside it, considering the institutional barriers, which is kind of related to something that I personally wanted to ask you of, of when, when addressing the Human Rights Council, especially under agenda item seven, which is the permanent agenda item that where Israel gets uh, unceremoniously slammed. Um, the I guess it's the outside messaging, it's the inside versus outside. And what is the maximum impact do you think? Can we impact both at the same time? Okay, so that's sort of two, two good questions. So the internal backlash around Ahmed's report is not for me to talk about. I mean, there's obviously always going to be also everyone's got internal biases. Uh, whether it's racism, whether it's discrimination about religion, whether it's all sorts of stuff. And I'm not talking about Ahmed, let me make this clear, but, but certainly around, you know, UN staff members and so on, it's certainly not my place to talk about. But I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to look at the follow-up report um, that Ahmed has, I think, submitted. Um, and, and to make clear that Ahmed's report has been very strongly supported by very excellent human rights experts. 
Um, as a result of the report in 2019, there was this high level expert appointed that's a little bit like the Deborah Lipstadt was, um, was, was appointed in terms of um, anti-Semitism in the US. There's been this high level sort of representative appointed for the UN. There's been all sorts of brilliant places and people, including my university that have adopted the IRA definition on anti-Semitism. There's been, there's been excellent steps forward. Um, any internal divergence or upset about, you know, anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse, not my problem, not any of our problem. I hope not Armour's problem. I just think that's a problem for people internally that don't understand um, that anti-Semitism is a human rights abuse. And, and this is one of the key reasons for me of why we engage with the UN human rights system is to change the narrative and to make sure that we are representative. Um, I've missed it out in my mind because I went down that route with the second part of the question. Sorry, Efra. Uh, the, uh, yes, so affecting, affecting the messaging to the outside. So what does, what does the role play of having a voice within the UN, speaking to the UN and the way that that message goes beyond the I UN? Mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really privileged to sit in the position that I do, um, both in terms of nationally, regionally, and internationally. And whenever I say to people, how many Jews do you think there are in the world? It can go from anywhere between, you know, 500 million to 4 billion. And I'm like, oh, there's like 14 to 23 million of us. Like, we, we. So I think that the messaging is so key externally both around anti-Semitism as a human rights abuse. And the basic things that I say to people like around being able to wear a kippah to, to, to walk down the road, right? And this idea that the public-private divide, in my mind, I'm fine. No one's beating my kid up or anyone else up. But actually in the regular mindset is why can't you walk down the road wearing a kippah? But also the, the bigger issues, which is around visibility, um, that there are so few Jews. So clearly no one's controlling COVID, right? which was a massive issue around many countries, particularly countries that didn't have Jews in them, which was Jews were controlling COVID and the vaccines. So again, the more information, the more we discuss anti-Semitism and Jews as individuals within the human rights framework, the more that we can actually get people to understand sort of on the micro and the macro. Um, I think it's absolutely crucial. I, I understand why so many Jews are so reluctant to work with the UN, but I also see how many Jews do work with OSCE, which is part of the EU or the Fundamental Rights Agency or the Inter-America System or even the African Union. I think, well, actually, if you brought this back, if you gave the UN a chance and brought this evidence, this data, this information back into them, then there would be a different understanding because, yes, we are in 98 of 193 countries, but in places like Myanmar, there are 13 Jews or Egypt, there's eight Jews. Or even in Iran, where there's 20,000 Jews, but who are hidden, most of these countries don't get the Jewish viewpoints and experiences, lived experiences being fed into them. Sorry, I'm talking too much, Afra, tell me off. No, no, I really, I could listen to you for hours. And um, I would love to thank you. Thank you, Rosa, for, first of all, for all that you do and your engagement and your bravery and your eloquence and for joining us and um please everyone thank you very very much for joining us and we hope that you will join us in the rest of uklfi charitable trust series we will be having another session on related to the un among other legal topics and um thank you everyone have a good evening or good day and we will see you soon